we are live on the air. Um, <laughs> well, not really at all, but... <laughs> okay, guys, hello. Welcome to the second 40 Projector podcast. My name is Dennis. And this is Robert Beams. Uh, and today we are going to be talking about, amongst other things, I'm sure, um, ambitious failures. So would you like to outline it a bit more, Rob? Yeah, it was it was sort of the idea broadly and, and a bit like last last time where, where we sort of uh, meandered all around the topic for two hours. It, it, it's possibly the same this time. But the, the, the main sort of thrust of it is just that there are those films out there that you... you kind of want to applaud and give a little bit of credit for the the clear ambition and the desire and the passion of the filmmakers and what they were trying for you know shooting for the moon um but sometimes those projects fall flat and that could be commercially it could be a massive you know box office disaster that's actually quite good or it could be you know a, a hit but the critics said what was this you know steam pile of shit or, or whatever or anything in between uh but 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 it's a failure on some level yeah. Um, that, that we can kind of applaud for its uh, audacity, let's say. That's it. And I've got a few as well that aren't massive movies per se with big budgets, but were perhaps ambitious in different ways, like, mm. you know, conceptually or whatever. Well, totally, because the thing is, is you could make an ambitious failure of a short film at, at uni, couldn't you? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could sort of go, well, it's all relative. All we've, yeah, all we've got is my mate Des and this car and a bin, <laughs> but we want to make a sci fi. Has opera, anyone had you know? a best friend called Des? <laughs> That's that's what I want to know. What's Des short for? Desmond, yeah. Yeah, I've never met a Desmond. Any Desmond out there listening, let us know. Uh, (laughs) If you're horribly offended, please let us know. (laughs) But uh, but you know what I mean? You can just kind of be a bit overambitious with what you've got available, you know? Totally. Uh, I mean, I would say at the opposite end of the spectrum, and probably another day I'd want to talk about those films that very effectively utilise very few elements and i think of films like lock when i think of that you know yeah lock or buried. Film. yeah or, or any or anything like that moon to some extent even though obviously yep. there's a lot of model work and effects stuff that goes into that but movies that or carnage is a good example right where you've got four actors in a room basically yeah i did love got. carnage though, um I yeah but, but 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 I applauded way, I mean, its I, simplicity yeah but yeah, I mean, I did, I did like it, but let's not get too sidetracked with the example. <laughs> I right didn't now. like that film. Let's talk about yeah, it for ten let's minutes. Talk about Carnage for two <laughs> two hours now. But the but but with uh, but with things like that, you've got uh, clearly a, a few elements, and you make the most of them over the screen time, right? You say like we've got Tom Hardy in a car, and we're going to yeah. absolutely ring everything we can get from Tom Hardy in a car over the next hour and a half. Whereas there are other movies that are throwing in new characters and elements and designs and concepts and themes every two minutes and it doesn't necessarily all hang together and I, I think to some extent that's the kind of films we're talking about although not necessarily exclusively there might be some things that work a bit better than that but but that's kind of what I have in mind anyway yeah yeah no that's exactly what I've been thinking as well so I'm gonna throw my hat in the ring uh, and offer up for our first one uh, Ang Lee's Hulk oh okay interesting yeah. I hadn't even really thought of Ang Lee's Hulk yeah, I don't know where it came from, uh, but it just came into my head when I was uh, thinking about it. Because, obviously, it came out around the time of Spider-Man and the first X-Men films when people were like, oh, we can make superhero films and they can be good. And they had that crazy expensive, really highly anticipated Super Bowl ad. Um, and then the film came out and everyone was like, what? <laughs> yeah, the thing I remember about Ang Lee's Hulk is that it's mainly just boring. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. But I think he really tried to do something different and approach it from sort of like a drama perspective yeah absolutely. you know so it is this big cgi spectacle thing but for large stretches of it it's like a man moping about his father and you know the past incidents that happened that you know made him who he is and all this kind of stuff but then also i don't know if it's unfair to say that he tried to temper that sort of indie drama aspect of it with the style mimicking um the art and sort of the framing of comic books or yeah. whether he just wanted to do that anyway. I don't know, but it's a really interesting attempt, I suppose, yeah. from the early days of this current comic book revival. Yeah, I think in a way, though, and I, I don't know Ang Lee's background in terms of comic books and whether or not he had any interest in the Hulk, but I think I think the thing about the split screen thing is it's the most obvious way to go, we're doing a comic book movie for yeah. someone's dad that doesn't know anything about comic books. Totally. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because the there thing is, 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 there's something is... about it though that works for me. I don't know. Like It gets a bit repetitive and annoying as the movie goes on, but at first I was like, ooh, this is kind of cool. And but then it got, wears off. 
you've got like for example in um age of ultron where uh joss whedon does the hero shot where suddenly everybody's in yeah. the frame and that looks like a splash page from a comic yeah but it but it's just but it's something done by somebody who you know joss whedon is not only a massive nerd and a comic book fan but he's written comics and it very much feels authentically like this is what super comic books look like this is the super comic book aesthetic you know yeah and it's, not, it's Hulk, not subtle it's... but it is more subtle than going oh look here's the lines you know yeah whereas, like whereas in angley's hulk it's it's uh it's it's more like the director of the ice storm has, has been asked to do a comic book movie <laughs> <laughs> and he went yeah okay yeah. sure we'll just we'll put some frames in <laughs> and what i really want to yeah. have our main character just mope around in his shitty apartment for two hours the worst thing about that movie um, is the end fight is just incoherent and just rubbish. It just my memory of it. I saw it when it came I out. I don't so even remember it. He fights, isn't it? Nick Nolte. Yeah. And Nick Nolte becomes another massive Hulk, and then the Hulk and Nick Nolte's Hulk both become huge, and they're like bigger than the world, and they just punch <laughs> each other in a fight. But that's what happens, right? They they become like bigger than the mountains, and they're like I don't know why or what's going on. Oh my on. god, that's but crazy! It's some kind of crazy bullshit happens at the end, and I I had, it just seems a bit sort of incoherent. But anyway, this is not the this is really not the time place to review Ang Lee's Hulk. No. But rather, what talk about its kind of ambition and and yeah, where it I, can be sort of applauded. And I think you're right. Is that um he was maybe one of the first to kind of say let's take these um comic book characters and try and do something that's just for want of a better word because i love the shit out of comic books and comic book movies but a proper film right yeah, yeah. and i think serious, that that's real yeah, serious real film and i think that's yeah. something that chris nolan did later more successfully but that Definitely. he was probably you could you could probably pinpoint and say he was the first to attempt that. I don't was Angley necessarily... ahead of his time. <laughs> he, was, he was possibly ahead Maybe. of his time. Yeah, I, and and it's uh, yeah, it's 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 an interesting one actually. It's good. It's interesting you brought that one up because I'd never really considered it that way. But no, I think you're probably right. I mean, yeah. the ones the ones I was thinking of probably the one that for me defines this whole um, f- genre, even though it isn't a genre. This whole sort <laughs> of uh, you know, if you were doing a um, a rep cinema uh, all nighter of these kinds of movies, I oh, think wow. that I think that the the headline act for me would be Cloud Atlas. Um, you see, I've never seen Cloud Atlas. I've been okay. so tempted. It's one of those films, you know, you almost dip in and then you just pull back at the last minute. You go, no, yeah, no. There's so many better films deserving my time, but it is curious and I want to see it. But I'm presuming you've seen it, yeah? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I saw, I saw so it came out. Tell us about it, please. Um, my memory of Cloud Atlas is 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 hazy in the details, but basically uh, the thing there's with too it many was, details, isn't there? There are That's too many details. In in a way, that is that is kind of it's an example of what I was saying at the start. It's a yeah. massive. It's a bag where everything has been thrown in and shaken around, right? Mm. And and the thing I find interesting about it as well is is if you look at it in terms of the um, what was going on behind the scenes and outside of the movie the fact that you've got these uh these these guys or girls now i suppose the the wachowskis uh who the wachowski siblings who were given um who had a, a, a credible success with bound and then had a commercially extremely successful and critically adored film in the matrix and then sorry what is that film the matrix that's the one the matrix uh okay. you should check it out it's, yeah? it's, it's decent yeah they did it did all this stuff that then got used by every advert for the next 10 years um oh. yeah yeah is that when but... the people pick up the phone they go what's that <laughs> <laughs> yeah is that, that in one. the matrix is that, that's the, is one. That that's thing? the one yeah. so you've got you've got they did bound they did the matrix and then they get given more money and more freedom and then the train just <laughs> goes off the tracks but in a spectacular fashion like like the what's interesting to me I'm does it go the off track. the tracks a bit like in uh, back to the future free is it, is it that style where it not just in doesn't... that way no not in a good way um so basically you get you get the reloaded one and I've, again i've seen the reloaded and revolutions once many many years ago and that was enough but from my memory of them it they reloaded really disappears up its own ass and is boring yeah and then revolutions is just total wall-to-wall cgi nonsense fest isn't it yeah it's, it's totally like that. that that's it like and... in the second one they really double down on their like um pretensions to high philosophy 
and it just becomes gobbledygook. Oh yeah, and, there's and just, then yeah, and that is the beginning of the end in terms of the visuals as well, because uh, you've got these rubber mask uh, Keanu Reeves fighting about a million different Agent Smiths, and then they've got stupid sound cues like um, a bowling ball hitting pins when he throws a bunch of the Smiths into each other and stuff. Just really oh, badly uh, pitched ideas, you know? Yeah, but it's uh, but again. This is the thing with both those movies. You still can't fault their ambition in either case. No. And then and then what happens is somehow they get given the money and creative freedom to make Speed Racer, which, you know, asterisk, I love. I love Speed Racer. Never right? seen it. But Speed Racer is... Um, is not a, a critical or commercial success, I don't think. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, lines, I right? think the, the, the uh, reaction was more bemusement, was it not, when it came yeah, out? People were just it, like, why? What? Who? Well, to me, I didn't, I didn't like the original Matrix when it came out. I wasn't into it. And then um, Speed Racer actually turned me on to the Matrix in a weird way. Because when you, see, when you see Speed Racer and you see that they're basically doing... I mean, I know Speed Racer was an anime in its own right. But, but from the context of our generation, when they're basically doing the Pokemon cartoon, but in live action basically yeah. is what it is yeah, yeah, yeah. and when you when you look at it like that and you go oh wow like all of the all of the shots all of the techniques all of the overacting and exaggeration right yeah. all of that's in there and when you see that suddenly the matrix made sense to me because the matrix then is that sort of ghost in the shell type anime right totally yeah. you, you watch and and so i watched the matrix back after that and i was like wow it's it's the same kind of thing but it's that kind of uh people being punched in the head and their faces exploding type anime <laughs> yeah. but the um but anyway, so he made Speed Racer, and that wasn't particularly successful. But then, after that, and Cloud Atlas was their next film, right? There was a hell of a gap, I think. Well, actually, I wanted to, yeah, because when did where does Vivent for Vendetta slot into this? Because they didn't, uh, they didn't direct that, they did. I they? know they didn't direct it, but their hands are all over it. Okay, so... well, I'm, I'm not touching it because I don't care about it. So push that to one side. Right, no, to only side. because it might explain <laughs> why they continued um, to have uh, backing. Maybe studio backing okay. and stuff like that because yeah, it was well, very well received or at least well received um, has a big fan base etc although they didn't direct it they produced it and I think they did have a hand in some of the direction okay. apparently so uh, so okay but well that, that that I guess explains the absence of anything between Speed Race and Cloud Atlas but then Cloud Atlas um, and they've since done it again with Jupiter Ascending which I just find amazing is where the studios again went you know what have all the money and do whatever you want and they've just been allowed to kind of yeah. go off the rails and to do whatever it's insane and, yeah and and in both cases and it doesn't make any conventional hollywood sense because you'd normally sort of your stereotype of the cigar chomping mogul would normally be a sort of uh play it very safe uh, yep. they're only as good as their last hit type aspect yeah. right and and what's happened here and I, I think it's they've got a very good it's joel is it joel silver that they work quite closely with so I don't know. the producer that, that did the matrix and stuff i think they've got a very good relationship with people behind the scenes basically mm, and there, okay. there are certain people who who obviously uh rate them and what they do yeah um just trying to think. I think it's Joel Silver. It doesn't make a tremendous amount of difference, but now it's in my head, and I have carry to on. I'll have out. a look. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, right. So they've they've uh, they've been given all this money to make uh, Cloud Atlas and and uh, yeah, Joel Silver. And he found it. Yeah. yeah. And and basically, they end up making this film that on paper is just nuts, right? And it's even more nuts in execution. But you know, you've got like. Um, all the white actors blacking up i was the, gonna say they blacked the white... up and asianed up people didn't they yeah like... they made people asian they made people black people white you know and, and it, there's no i don't necessarily even think there's been any claims to any sort of racism or anything inappropriate with it because the thing with cloud atlas as well is that there's this cast of characters that is racially ethnically diverse like these yeah. act, the actors in the cast are diverse and all of them swap and do characters across time that are all different races so the Asian and that's the theme play of the white film, characters and stuff as well yeah there's a kind of, sort of. we are all one type yeah. you know thing about humanity going on in there but basically it's it goes between um it, it like races between a kind of far-flung post-apocalypse where we're all cavemen uh there's like a kind of matrix style jupiter ascending style kind of high concept sci-fi one mm. um there's uh there's relatively boring ones that are just set sort of in our world it kind of goes all between all these different elements um i guess a bit like the fountain sort of 
Yeah. Throws itself for, which is another film I guess you could throw into this kind of category. Ooh, but I um, wouldn't. But I mean, we I, get I into would. That later. I would. But but the. Uh, um, but yeah, it's it's just kind of a, a massive crazy mess, and it's it's one that I kind of when I watched it the first time. I looked at in awe, really, because I was kind of like, I hated that, and I thought it had almost no redeeming qualities. But uh, I can't really fault just the gumption yeah. of these people who've made it, yeah, who've put yeah, this yeah. thing together, who've the written balls it. On them. Yeah, the, the yeah, exactly, and 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 kind of who've who've written this thing, who've gone through, who've shown it to other people, who've <laughs> who've made who've made who've convinced other people to part with hundreds of millions of dollars to make this happen, <laughs> and then they went and they actually did it, and then they made people go and see it at the cinema, and it's the, the stones on that. <laughs> yeah, and all is. the people that yeah. signed up to do it as well. You got yeah. Tom Hanks, Hal Berry, you know, to yeah. name but two. Yeah, so. no, it's, it's got a, it's got a kind of all, all star cast. It's quite, uh, it's yeah. quite something. I mean, I'd, I'd say it's worth watching in a way that um, I think is why it's interesting. Hopefully, for the dear listener to to do this topic, which is that a lot of these films, I think there's a criteria, kind of a cat, not criteria, category of films out there that might not be good but are worth your time. Yeah, I think and you and I... me have talked about this before, actually, about how sometimes it is more interesting instead of instead of watching like a film that is a canonized classic, or um, well, so yeah, basically something like that, then to actually go with something a bit riskier because it might be more interesting to think about and experience. I think I think Cloud Atlas definitely is is worth a watch because it's just so there's nothing really like it. The only film in the world that's like Cloud Atlas, and this is the thing that really blows my mind, is Jupiter Ascending, just because they were just because they were able to then go and do it again, and I, which I just think is mad. And then but, isn't know. there a lot of like overlap in terms of the themes and the ideas as well between Jupiter Ascending and the Matrix with like the sla- the slavery of the human race and all this kind of stuff? Yeah, there is there is a lot of bullshit in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. As a concept, I don't mind that. It depends how you do it, obviously. Yeah, because um, there's lots um, of you know possible real world analogies, etc. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy film in which uh, Channing Tatum is part dog, and that turns <laughs> Mila Kunis on. You know, she also have sex with the sexy dog man. It's it's very very strange, but like it's a film where Channing Tatum has like, if I remember rightly, like he's like a he's like a sexy wolf who has a jetpack and roller skates or something. It's like really <laughs> mad. It's like sounds like something out of like a nineties kids cartoon. It sounds like something out of a thirteen year old's dream journal. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the whole thing is. <laughs> Channing Tatum's character is very much the sort of. Um, I don't know, like a piece of fan art for a character that you know, like like they based it on the fan art. The fan yeah, art came yeah. first. <laughs> that's what that's a lot. What sort of Jupiter Jupiter Ascending in particular feels like for me. I mean, Cloud Atlas is an ambitious failure that I didn't really like, but I applauded what they were doing. And then Jupiter Ascending tips right over into just this no, is stop, just yeah, stop, yeah, don't yeah, do yeah. it again. Uh, I've had I think that they must be out now, surely. I have no idea. Well, they did. They did that TV show, didn't they? Uh, Sensei. Ah, uh, yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, uh, Sensei, which was very well received. So maybe they're back in. Maybe they've got four hundred oh, million nice. lined up for their next project. <laughs> for the next kind of... crazy LSD-induced concept but, they come up with. But in a way, I want them to carry on getting all this money. And doing no, this so do I. I'm, I'm joking, because... really, because I'd rather see that than uh, Chips Two. You know. <laughs> Well, you know, I don't, I don't want to watch what they do next, but I just, I like that it's out there. I like that they're doing it. No, that's what I mean. Like, see it yeah. be released, not actually see yeah. it. I don't want to see it. No, I don't no. want somebody to spend hundreds of millions of their money on something I don't want to see. So I can but laugh I can and then possibly scoff at something. Possibly laugh at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's like I haven't seen I haven't seen um, Valerian, the City of a Thousand Planets. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, that's and, the one. Yeah. Um, I I imagine that that film, just from the trailers and the reaction and the fact it seems to have bombed at the box office, is is very much in this camp as well. Of totally of kind of like they've given this guy with a with a patchy track record. Luke Besson obviously uh, has been a great filmmaker and has made some very good films. But yeah. the Nikita's got, great, Leon's yeah. great. Um, and then they've given him a lot of money to make something that looks extremely ambitious and out there and it's one of those things where I'd like to watch I've not seen it so I can't speak to the quality of Valerian no, but can one I. thing I can probably say with some confidence is that I doubt it's boring and I think that it's yeah. probably interesting in terms of 
um, even if it's just the visuals or, or whatever. I, I think that there's probably some some uh, some worth in it, and I think that's what's interesting about films in this in this category. Anyway, I've I've kind of gone on for a while on it. What other ones would you uh, sort of bring to the party? Okay, um, I think I'm going to cement my status as the sort of uh, little um, hipster brat in this conversation, but I wanted to talk about I'm Still Here. Yeah. Casey Affleck yeah, directed yeah, yeah. Um, sort of... You're the hipster. I saw the premiere of that at the Venice Film Festival. Oh, you did, didn't you? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> Man, that must have been really exciting. What, to see the premiere of I'm Still Here? Yeah, because uh, people still didn't no one know knew whether what it, it was serious yeah. or not, or what was That's going true. on, did they? No, I was I was really intrigued. I was really, really intrigued. And I, yeah. saw, the, I saw the press conference afterwards, and, and they kind of carried on the shtick to some extent, and the um and a lot of the respected kind of guardian and whatever uh uh critics were kind of standing up and you could tell that the the opinion had turned on it from mm. curiosity to kind of why are you wasting my time well that's young, exactly why i young. want to talk about it because yeah. yeah let's just outline it quickly for people that don't know um, yeah it's a film directed by casey affleck um ben affleck's uh younger brother i think he's younger anyway brother um, and it stars Joaquin Phoenix. And prior to the film's release, Joaquin Phoenix had publicly come out and saying that he'd retired from filmmaking, from being an actor, and now that he was going to be a rapper. Not only that, but he was sporting a big uh, beard um, and was going around with just sunglasses on indoors, which is always a cool move. If uh, Just a pro tip out there for anyone watching who wants to be a cooler person, wear sunglasses indoors. It definitely works. Anyway, um, so yeah, he was doing lots of talk show um, appearances and just generally being weird. Um, and no one knew whether to take it seriously or not or what was going on um, and then the film basically charts this uh, ostensibly it's about him trying to make it as a rapper um, but when you see the film I don't know should we say or not it's kind of public knowledge now isn't it yeah 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 it's public yeah. knowledge that Joaquin Phoenix wasn't actually turning into a mad reclusive rapper yeah exactly <laughs> so it's a mockumentary of sorts an experiment of sorts um to try and explore fame, people's relationship um, with fame and uh, maybe even overarching or overreaching uh, ambition on the part of many uh, artists. For example, Jim Carrey was an interesting recent example where he came out as a, a long term private painter, allowed someone to do a documentary about him uh, and in his studio and stuff. And then unfortunately got um, widely uh, lampooned for it. Um, yeah. So it's kind of about that kind of stuff as well, but also about the excesses of fame um, and famous people and the, the power and stuff that it affords you. But also just uh, quite a lot of juvenile humour as well, uh, thrown in for good yeah. measure, just him being a dick. It's, I think that where the ambition really comes in is that Casey Affleck kept this up for two years yeah <laughs> and and that he didn't make any films between two lovers in 2008 and then and then i'm still here didn't yeah. make any movies so it's it's really take that uh... christian bale yeah you want to talk about um, <laughs> talk about uh, method acting yeah but it's but no that's that is what's really interesting about it i think is 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 uh is the dedication obviously that phoenix kind of threw into the whole thing because you've seen the movie right yep the uh yeah of course and the um he's keeping the shtick up in Hollywood amongst his peers as well, right? There's yeah. all these scenes in there where he's around other actors and there you can see they all think he's the world's biggest dick. The Ben Stiller uh, scene. The is, Ben Stiller is... scene, I think, stage. Like the Ben Stiller Could scene, be. some of it's scripted because Ben Could Stiller, be. Ben Stiller, they come in and they, they kind of joke about Greenberg, which Ben Stiller was making at the time. And yeah. it all seems very much like Ben Stiller's possibly in on it. But there, yeah, are, definitely, yeah, there are definitely other scenes. I think it's one of those like um, Borat or Ali G type things where... Um, uh, it's one of those where they've scripted some of the nucleus of the whole thing, some of the spine and some of the key scenes, and then they've also done some let's go behind the scenes Just on the, on the fly. stupid stuff. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, for me, um, it doesn't work. It is a failure. Um, and I think for general audiences and critics, it wasn't massively well received either. Oh, Not it flopped I completely. I don't think it got... Um, I don't think it did anything i mean we i was working at the the uh duke york cinema in brighton at the time and i remember uh we were supposed to be playing it i don't even know if we did end up playing it for a whole week wow. i think we just played a couple of shows and no one came yeah and i just looked up on wikipedia it's final box office is basically like half a million so and how much did uh, it cost it doesn't say i can't imagine well, i mean it cost it cost a lot in terms of the time that hakeem yeah and Casey well, I mean, and publicity you think of... as well they spent a lot of money yeah that's talking true. about it and doing shit didn't they the thing is but though yeah... is that 
for for both people involved the film was a failure but for both people involved i would argue it's been a massive success because totally. joaquin phoenix and casey affleck have gone from that to suddenly do a lot of credible projects and yep. i wonder whether if joaquin phoenix hadn't gone and done that whether paul thomas anderson would have used him in the master or whether he'd have been the yep. guy in her and because in her there's... advice and all that it seems like it gave joaquin phoenix a rub of a kind of actor credibility for having done that for two years that if you look at his films before then i I don't really think he necessarily had yeah no i completely agree i think he was sort of tipping his toes in that stuff um but just wasn't making the impact he wanted so this was some sort of well i'm not saying it was just for this but it definitely worked as a as a stepping stone uh, into more interesting more rewarding uh, better paying roles um but yeah we should also talk about i suppose um the controversy surrounding the film, uh, which is that several women that worked on the film uh, alleged that both Casey Affleck and Joaquin Phoenix, I think to a degree, um, were sexually inappropriate with them, uh, which is pretty horrible, pretty grim. Um, I don't think it was public knowledge at the time the film came out, but it's come out since. Um, and it's in the news quite a lot now because obviously all this stuff's going on with men in Hollywood. Um, so yeah, that's regrettable uh, and a shame. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't really know what, what, what to add about that. I mean, I, no, I hadn't heard about add, really. that. I, just, with, I didn't, I didn't yeah. want to talk about the film and not mention it, basically. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's um, it's not something I was aware of with I'm Still Here. I knew that there had been allegations against Casey Affleck back when he was nominated for his uh, for his Oscar, wasn't it? Which he then won. But, yeah, but uh, those yeah. allegations were from I'm Still Here. from I'm Still Here, okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting, I didn't um, realise that. But yeah, um, but anyways, as a film... Uh, I didn't like it very much. I thought that it was an interesting experiment uh, and a laudable uh, attempt to do something different, but it just doesn't hang together. And a lot of it is just them messing around. Oh, it's pretty self-indulgent. Yeah, it's really yeah. self-indulgent. And I don't know, it just didn't work for me in the end. In a way, though, in a way, it's being massively self-indulgent, I think. And, and you could argue otherwise. I'm just going to go on a limb here. I think it's being massively self-indulgent is why it's disqualified in this category. Because I mm. think because I think the thing with um, Cloud Atlas, as an example, there's a kind of purity to their ambition. It's kind of like, we just want to make this this amazing, wonderful vision we've got for a film yeah, for the people. For, for the people. <laughs> and, yeah. and, the world, and it's kind of like a film they made that the world kind of wasn't ready for or didn't understand, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Whereas well, I'm it, still it, here it... is two jack-offs behind the stage <laughs> just being complete <laughs> arseholes, you know? <laughs> I, don't know? I don't know how much purity of intent there was behind that movie. Yeah, no, agreed. Well, if that is uh, a disqualifying factor, then I've just lost half the films <laughs> on my list. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it is really a disqualifying factor. Because obviously, <laughs> no, I know. Obviously, there are great movies made from from people gazing at their own navel as well but that's yeah. uh but yeah it, it's a slightly different topic but I, I thought it was um interesting and worth a mention but yeah. what, what else did you want to talk about um well i've i've written down that i don't want to this will probably be a recurring gag over the podcast because i'll probably bring up star wars episode one the phantom menace every <laughs> single time we ever speak because which well, i we, do in regular conversation about we should anyway. mention as well that we tried to do a podcast years ago um but it got scuppered by um technical issues that we yeah. were i was too lazy or too distracted to solve at the time um and the first episode was all about um just why, episode one, why we like it? the why phantom like menace <laughs> yeah so, so uh so there you go you've kind of let the cat out of the bag there we like it right yeah leave us alone guys uh god <laughs> It's a good movie. Um, yeah, it's 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 decent. But the uh, yeah. but anyway, this is something we now have to dive deeper into at another at another time. But yeah, uh, but um, I think that's the thing with the Star Wars prequels as well. Uh, is that say what you will about the merits of the Star Wars prequels versus uh versus the Force Awakens, um, but the Force Awakens is extremely safe. It's going. I don't know. Loads of people have said over and over again that it's a remake of A New Hope and blah blah. So I'm not. Mm-hmm making out i'm coming up with anything clever and new here but i know that it's like it's very much in some cases even shot for shot going on very safe territory from what happened in the previous films these are the characters you liked here are the fun things that they do let's put them, like to the fact where there's no character development of han solo because they've basically gone well let's put old han solo back doing what young han solo used to do yeah so he's yeah, now yeah. just on his ship with chewbacca running bad schemes the thing is and this is a m- massive tangent but i have to say it now because it's coming to my head <laughs> the thing is is that young han solo who's a lovable rogue who gets things wrong but bumbles through is charming old han solo who's left his wife lost his kids and is now with his friend from when he was 20 years old and now they're doing shit heists that are going wrong is pathetic 
But that's so what I liked about it. Different... But I don't know if this is what the film was going for or not, but I think it might have been. But I liked that. It showed that he was just stuck in a rut of trying to replay his younger years. Yeah, but was uh, there and ever... he fucked everything up. Was there ever know. a part of you as a kid with a Han Solo toy who was like, you know what? I hope if they make a future film, he's pathetic. <laughs> no, but I'm not a kid anymore. <laughs> no, but I'd Star Wars... The thing is for me is that it... I need. I wanted to see Han Solo being the character that I liked, you know, not the. To be honest with you, I don't even like Han Solo. <laughs> I actually quite dislike Han Solo and most Harrison Ford like big performances or characters that he's well known for. Um, I always find him a bit of a dick. We've we've gone we've massively deviated now. Yeah, we've we gone, have. We've we gone have, down the have. rabbit hole from this is how the last one ended up two hours long because <laughs> we've gone from talking about the prequels to talk about Force Awakens, talk about a specific scene and what that did to Han Solo as a character, to then talk about the <laughs> life and career, career of Harrison Ford, and the screen persona. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a Wikipedia journey we're making people listen to. Um, but the, <laughs> Those but, times but, when you look up from the screen right. and it's like three a.m. and you go shit. <laughs> But, but, but rewind, but podcast, rewind, right? rewind. So, so yeah, basically, rewind. like whatever you think of of the uh, the Force Awakens and whatnot, and the the prequels, the, they're they're trying to hit a lot of the same notes to the point where there's even a scene where Han Solo's wearing the uh, winter stuff from the Empire Strikes Back on Hoth, yeah. but he's wearing it now on a snowy moon. It's like, oh, we need to get everything else. We need to get everything in, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas the prequels were. Um, and episode two and three, I have no, I'm not going to defend at all. They're just appalling movies. But the the prequels, they are trying for something different. They're shooting for something different. And arguably, where the wheels come off after episode one, because like I say, I like that one. But arguably, the reason two and three get worse is because Lucas derailed his own vision because everyone criticized episode one so suddenly he was trying to throw in more fan service and in yeah. episode two and three you get a lot more just winky winky look at this thing you guys all know from the other movies stuff which is all that rogue one and force awakens are they're chock full of that bullshit uh I, well, I enjoyed both movies by the way and i like rogue one an awful lot but it is full of pointless like here are the two guys from the cantina from the first movie yeah, remember that was everybody too much. you know <laughs> it's yeah. uh um and so, whereas the thing with, with episode one, I think the thing that um, upset a lot of people uh, is is that it's not really trying to tr- hit the same notes or be the same thing. It's a completely different thing. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, for example, the originals are about um, spaceships and rogues and, and heroes rescuing princesses. And the prequels are specifically just about these jedi commando superhero dudes who yeah kind it's, of a, it's a really weird story if you actually break it down <laughs> yeah, and put yeah. it, like forget all the context of oh it's star wars and just read the story and change the names it's fucking weird it's really <laughs> weird um but i will say something that um you say that it's super ambitious but i think that um especially in the case of the second and third it there's also an, an element of lack of ambition because the, i know this it's very been it's been done so many times to like show those shots of George Lucas sitting in the director's chair and not really paying attention and all this kind of thing, which could very easily be taken out of context. But there definitely is a sense, especially, like I say, in the second and third, where he's just gone, we'll fix it in post. I'm not really bothered about how... Oh, yeah, the second the and third, absolutely. I, yeah. I don't care if you give much emotion. I didn't put too much thought into the dialogue, but we're going to have crazy shit flying all over the place. The ambition, so, the ambition for two is the ambition of filming the first fully digital major film basically that's the ambition yeah. there the ambition of one in a kind of cinema history sense is having the first cgi creatures that were characters in the movie you know i mean it was those kinds of things that that were on the technical side ambitious uh, have you have you seen the film side by side no i think we talked about this last time the one with keanu reeves and the you hadn't seen yeah it, right? we have to yeah learn. i haven't seen because it. there's uh there's a lot of stuff in that where george lucas is being a proponent for digital film yeah. and he's arguing against the people saying well digital film doesn't look as good as 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 35 mil which in lots of cases has been true certainly it was attack of the clones looks terrible like yeah. it didn't look as bad at the time when i remember it as a kid but looking back at it now it no, looks awful. awful right yeah. compared to one which was shot on film two looks really really ropey it looks like a video game cutscene. yeah and the um the, and the a, thing that always sticks out a, for me is that um in the phantom menace yoda is still a puppet and then you go from phantom menace to attack of the clones and it's like oh god 
Really? I mean, oh. the, pup, the puppet looks shit. I think the CGI Yoda was an improvement, but the, the I don't digital, think so. I really the don't digital think so. photography. That um, could just be like bias, subjectivity, etc. But for me, the puppet wins far by far at that at that point for that CGI. I don't know. But anyway, uh, yeah. yeah so in what... terms of story and acting and directing acting, I think it was very unambitious. Personally, the trilogy as a whole. But in terms of technical stuff and all that jazz. But yeah, as I was saying, much. as I was saying about George Lucas in Side by Side, um, the the thing he says about it with uh, with the digital film and the thing he says to defend it is that yeah, it looks shit now, but we're working at this thing from the bottom and we're trying to work on it to make it better. And by making these shit films with it now, he doesn't say it like that, but yeah. we're making films that look like they do now, we're pushing it forward to a point where maybe one day it'll look better than 35mm, but we're we're having to start at the bottom with it again. 35mm got taken to as far as it could go, and now yeah. we're trying to take this on. And I think the thing is, is that he, he, to some extent, was taking one for the team with episode two, because I think he himself mm. would admit that it doesn't look particularly great, but he wanted to try and get digital film going. And uh, another thing that's ambitious about those movies, and okay, you could say, well, it's very limited risk because it's Star Wars and it's going to make money, but they're technically independent films. He basically financed yeah. those films himself. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think, um, I think there's a lot to be said for for a lot of what Lucas did with those movies from that from that point of view. I think I think you're completely right about uh, how with two and three he just clearly doesn't give a shit. And in fact, there's a deleted scene on on um, not a deleted scene a behind the scenes on um, Star Wars Episode Two where the special effects guys are showing him all the that's animatics. That's right. Yes, they're that's one of the clips him, I'm talking about. Yeah, they're showing him all the animatics of things from the battles in the at the end of the movie, and uh, he's just like oh yeah that's great you know and he's yeah. just saying yeah do that and it, it's kind of like oh wow he just didn't give a shit yeah, like and yeah, there's yeah. and there's um, bits at the end of that movie where suddenly all of his very traditional because the thing about phantom menace is it's very traditional in terms of the framing and the screen totally. and all that because george lucas is a student of very traditional movies i mean he's influenced by people like ford and kurosawa and people yeah. like that and and episode one is quite traditional in that kind of sense and then in attack of the clones you suddenly get like first person shots of shaky cam of clones walking through mm. mist and it's all yeah. very like all over the place and i wonder to some extent and maybe i'm kind of armchair psychoanalyzing george lucas but i wonder if to some extent after he made Star Wars episode one and i think he was pretty convinced people were going to love it because the thing is but they look sort at... of did at first didn't they the first like initial reaction from people out of the cinema was like it's amazing but, but I think that he thought, hey, this is people are going to love it. I'm going to be nominated for Best Picture and Best Director. And everyone's going to just think this is the best thing that anyone's ever done. And I think he thought it was great. And then, uh, and I don't think it's great. I just like it more than most people like it. But I don't think it's a great movie. But like, I think he thought it was great. And I think what happened is he came out and people just tore it to shreds. And then he made two and three out of a sort of, well, I've started, so I guess I've got to finish. But I don't think, <laughs> but I don't think his heart was in it anymore. You know what I mean? A workmanlike like, uh, commitment to the task. Yeah, I don't. I don't think his heart was in it anymore. I think. I think with episode two, he was able to buoy himself up and carry on because he got excited about the technical possibilities of digital film. Yeah. But I don't think, in terms of making the movie, he gave a shit anymore. And yeah. I, I can understand quite likely, that. Quite likely. Like, I can understand that. Like, I oh, can totally. understand being in a position where you've put it out there, you've been working on it for years, and then people go, this is complete shit. And, then and you also, go, well, if why you've do I been care? put what, on a pedestal for so many years, and it's not even years, it's decades, you know, as like the filmmaker, and then suddenly you're ripped from that position very violently in the space of what, you know, mm. six months. Yeah, I mean, he was definitely, yeah, definitely did his reputation no favours either. Um, but but I think I think the ambition from my point of view in terms of the story of, of Phantom Menace is less less that it's ambitious in its own right and more that's ambitious in that he didn't just go people like Star Wars I'm going to make Star Wars again set 30 years before yeah. or whatever because the and thing I... is that movie is completely different it involves just entirely different concerns like, concerns and characters and themes. themes and it just looks very different not again he keeps a lot of that traditional hollywood um like the aesthetic to a lot of the compositions but the things that he uh that he's shooting are completely different 
right and it's yeah no i I agree and i think um you're right you can say what you want about the prequels but at least he tried to do something different he may have failed but he did try to do something different and i i agree with you as well what you were saying about the force awakens just quickly um that yeah it's a retread that's what everyone's saying it's true but i think on some level they kind of needed to do that at least for the force awakens because my hope personally is that now they go off and they try something different but I think they needed to kind of get people back in a bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I think The Force Awakens was very much a case of them going, look, guys, remember you like Star Wars? Yeah, like, de- definitely. It. Absolutely was. Um, but the thing that I find very telling about The Force Awakens, for me personally as a viewer, is that um, I love, not just like, but I absolutely love all of the scenes that are just the new characters. They're great. The, scene, yeah. the best scene in the entire movie is when Finn and um, Poe Dameron are in the TIE Fighter, oh, and, that, and that is 100% authentic Star Wars, because it's, yeah. two, it's two characters who are having kind of fun back and forth with each other, shooting things out the sky in a kind of cool 50 serial Indiana Jones escapist yeah, way, yeah, yeah. where it's just all silly, and then they're, and they're just having a good time. And then it's the energy, it's that a, energy that was missing from the prequels. For there's me. a great, yeah, there's a great energy to them, and it, and it feels very authentic, and and it's it's really easy to immediately latch on to who, two people who are still at that point brand new characters. And mm-hmm. then you get a scene with BB-8 and Ray and Finn, and they're having that banter about him saying that he's with the rebellion, and BB-8 yeah. like that he isn't. And that yeah, scene yeah, yeah. is also brilliant. Right. And then Han Solo, tired Han Solo walks in with his I'm here for the money face and the movie just the oxygen, the oxygen leaves the room. And I just from that point on, like I still enjoyed the movie. And by the way, I'm not I don't hate Force Awakens. But from that point on in the movie, I was definitely in a place of of uh, of less excitement because yeah. it felt like the energy had, had come. and the thing is as well is I don't even consider it and okay this is a really geeky conversation to go off and have but I don't even consider Force Awakens canon as far as whoa, I'm concerned that isn't whoa. even canon right <laughs> because when I when I'm when I'm looking back and watching the uh the old films I'm not gonna be like oh yeah oh Han Solo oh after he does this after he is with Leia and they she's pregnant and they're having the twins or whatever and blah 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 well whatever, no I'm getting my stories mixed up she's not pregnant with twins but you know what I mean after yeah, yeah. after all of that and she's having a baby and all that and the credits come up bah, 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 and it's the end of the original Star Wars films I'm not sitting there as an 11 year old going oh yeah and then they're like work out complete shit you know <laughs> like yeah. the thing is is the original this is what i mean about those characters i know you say well i've grown up and i want to see something new but the thing is is that um star wars is a fairy tale star wars is a fantasy story and at yeah. the end of that original fantasy story the characters have achieved their you know they've achieved what they set out to achieve they've achieved um kind of happiness you know they found peace in the galaxy they've changed and han solo's had a character arc and he had a good character han solo has the best character arc in the original trilogy because he goes from the snarky not guy, giving a shit yeah. he goes to the side guy who doesn't give a shit and he organically comes around to be the guy that does give a shit that they can depend on and you know that's his character arc and then to to lazily fast forward it 30 years or whatever and then go no no he went back and he was the same but now it's sad and pathetic now his kid's gonna kill him and he's not been with his wife for years and it's all horrible and sad to me when i watched the original star wars that's not canon that's not what happens to han solo after return mm. of the jedi han solo yeah. and princess leia they go and live in a nice house and they have their kid <laughs> and their life's fine because that is not the ending of return of the jedi the ending of return of the jedi is they've done it yeah i can appreciate that i really can and if maybe if i liked han solo more i would feel the same as you because i can imagine someone doing something similar with a, a property that i love um, it's not about really love of Han Solo. It it's like about that. the arc. The arc is now unsatisfying. The arc is now broken. Not for me. Not for me. I don't know. I don't know why. Because I can completely see what you're saying on paper, but I just found it really satisfying. I don't know. I'll have to think about that and get back to you. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting one. But we've really, okay, really uh, tangented it right up now, haven't we? Tangent. Say again. Heads. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tangent it doesn't matter. Par, par for the course. Yeah. Uh, okay. I think let's just do one more then, um, and then we'll get onto our uh, best ofs. So I think a good one to be talking about, maybe it depends on your opinion, would be Interstellar. I, I don't know. See, from I, I personally didn't like Interstellar, but neither cr- did I. Cr- critically and commercially, that film was super successful. So, but I, there is a there is a vocal minority that say it failed in its chief aim. Which is but, what to 
to bore me senseless because it succeeded very well in that one. <laughs> no, it's to move you. It's to have that emotional thing of like love is oh, a yeah. dimension. But, but here's the thing about Christopher Nolan, right? Christopher Nolan can't move you because he's a robot. That's it. Like, I completely like, agree. Like, I, I love... I Stop love, trying um, to move me. You can't do it. I enjoy um, Memento. I, I enjoy The Prestige. I like The Batman. The first two of his Batman films, Dark Knight Rises, is fun to watch but has massive problems. Again, but, Dark Knight Rises um, could be on the list as well. Oh, yeah. But... Uh, the thing is, is that all of his films fall short when the characters are supposed to, if there's any romance, if there's any yeah, love. Yeah, that's, if that's the why Inception like each other. loses a few marks for me as well. Oh, Inception, just... I just don't like. That's when I fell off the really? Nolan wagon. That's when oh, okay. I, was, I, was, I was full steam aboard the Nolan train going into Inception. <laughs> and then I watched Inception and went, that was a pile of crap. It threw me okay. off the Nolan train. Um, I mean, the, the main thing, and again, not to get into a half an hour Inception discussion, but the main thing with Inception is that um, every single line of dialogue in Inception, I don't think there's an exception. You try and find exposition. one or two, but I'll be very sorry, is exposition. Yeah. Every single line. Yeah. Um, and it, and the ex- exposition is all centred around one thing. It, the film is telling you this film is clever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing so is, what the me, film's doing... Yeah. yeah, and what the film's doing most of the way through is middlingly clever to, oh, that's a little bit clever. Yeah. But the way the film thinks about itself is that, hang on, guys, this thing we're doing is so Mind clever blowing. that we're going to have to tell you everything yeah. we're doing as we're doing yeah, it all yeah. the way through the movie. And we're going to have to have characters just explain themselves all the way through the movie. Like um, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Ellen Page, their whole character is just... Did uh, you know this I'm thing? Let me tell you question. about this thing. Did you know this thing? Yeah, right. And and so basically, like I watched that, and that film that film has zero heart to it, right? It has z- zero. Yeah, it tries of, though. It really to. tries to make oh, you care really about tries. Um, yeah, Cobb. Hob. Um, <laughs> Dom. I, I think he's called Dom. Dom Cobb. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's his name. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> it's such a stupid name. It's like it, like if Tom Hardy did a grunt and they just that as, that as a name, you know? <laughs> like if he did like a, a some sort of charity thing where he said, I will come to your child's birth and I will grunt and that could be the name of your child. Dom! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Jesus. No offence to any real life Dom Cobbs out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah really, really, really sorry. It's, it's very, very possible there's a Dom Cobb in, in our listenership. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that that part that it thinks it's uh, way cleverer than it is, and that the dialogue is like ninety percent exposition. Exposition. I mean, there's but... there's, there's obviously great technical stuff in yeah, it. Yeah, I, I still really they, enjoyed it. But but that's that's Nolan all over for me is that he's technically one of the people at the very top of the class, and he will put together a film that is incredibly slick, and it will probably inspire people who are kids now or yeah, going through film school definitely. now who are going to grow up and say, you know what, the person who inspired me was watching the films Christopher nolan absolutely no doubt and i think he's a genuine artist and an auteur but his movies don't have uh, a heart to them and i don't mean that they're not maudlin and sentimental and blah 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 but i just mean that they um they just fail to connect on an emotional level yeah. and i think the, the best example of that for me and we've talked about it before i know off pod is oh, pod. all of the attempts all of the attempts in his batman trilogy to try and in- inject some sort of humor they yeah. always work so badly. It really like fails. In, Dark Knight, in Dark Knight Rises, when Catwoman leaves him alone on the roof, and he goes, "So that's what that feels." Yeah. <laughs> or, uh, or the bit where um, the bit where the, they're in that car chase with the Joker, and there's the those kids. guys going, "Oh God, oh no, that's bad." Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the the helicopter pilot and the policeman Actually, in the van. There is a, a subtle joke that, I, not even a joke really, but like an amusing moment. Do you remember when the kids are like pretending to shoot stuff? Oh, pretending to shoot the cars, and then one of them explodes. Yeah, and it's cause, that was kind yeah, of. I was yeah, like, yeah. all right, go on. That, that was that was nice. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a clever moment. Yeah, I'll yeah. give that one a, a pat, a pat on the head. And also, the... I will say, like, not to switch around too much, but in Interstellar, there is one moment that worked for me emotionally, and that's when they go on the planet uh spoilers for interstellar for like two minutes if you want to skip ahead they go onto the planet and they think it's just regular time and then they come back and all that time's gone and then they have to watch all the logs and it was it manipulative yes did it work for me yes i was like almost crying at that scene i don't know why if it was the strength of the acting or what but it really got me the concept maybe more than anything the the concept the concept definitely gets me in interstellar but that's an easy win because the concept is really universal yeah, I mean the concept. The concept is just you know. Oh, imagine if you went in space and then everyone you love was dead and you've only gone by a year or whatever yeah. it is, right? That's sad. Yeah. Whether you do anything effective in the filmmaking or not, yeah. right? But I think the later um, attempts in the film don't work for me. 
at all. Yeah. But that particular scene, I was like, okay, fair enough. Like maybe you've got but, a, uh, a but, glimmer of a heart in you somewhere. <laughs> but just to just to wrap up my point on the Batman, yeah, sorry, films, go on. I've always thought I've always thought on the on, with the humor in the Batman films. And again, I like the Dark Knight a lot. I like Batman Begins a lot. But with the humor in the Batman films, it always felt to me like someone, especially when you see Christopher Nolan interviewed and stuff, like someone who's going like. Oh, what do people? Yeah, like? yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, people, people like jokes. Put a, put a couple of <laughs> jokes in for the pro. Yeah, totally, you know, that's totally. What it feels like for me, like I, I don't even think he thinks those are no, funny moments. No, not at all. I think he's just like, oh, it's just come lip on. service. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree and, with you. <laughs> and so I think that whenever something has to have an actual heartbeat, it's like there's. Okay, how about this in Dark Knight Rises? This sums Nolan up for me. Dark Knight Rises, there's the only thing that passes for a sex scene in any of those Batman movies, and it's on like a bearskin rug in front of an open fire. <laughs> right? I don't <laughs> even remember that is, scene. Yeah, that's where Marion Cotillard sleeps with. Oh, uh, yeah. Bell. Oh, yeah. God. Right? And that scene is genuinely on the floor in like a fur rug room or whatever in front of an open fire because. Christopher Nolan is extremely intelligent and very, very um, kind of inventive when it comes to portraying big sci-fi concepts. Yep. But suddenly, when he's asked to do something to Small, do with romance intimate, or some people, he's know. just he's just gone back to the pool of movie visuals for what that is, yeah. and then just found it because he doesn't know what that looks I'd like. I'd really and like to know that... what his home life is like. Like, is he ever just maybe I mean, he's I just wanna... never home? Maybe he's like one of those 1950s businessmen, you know? Yeah, sends the kids a I mean, present I don't, I don't now wanna, and again. I don't wanna, yeah, I don't want to cast aspersions on him personally or in his personal life, but but the uh, but definitely in movies it would seem he seemed quite cold in his movie. Yeah. the movies themselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and, and for the record again, like I enjoyed Dunkirk. I thought it was perfectly good at what it was doing. But Dunkirk is a movie that succeeds because he didn't have to have any women in it, and yeah. he didn't have to have any romance. Families, and because he was just showing, yeah, because he was able to just show men going off and doing man things in the in the war. Yeah. Um, he's able to do what is a very technically proficient movie that hits all the right marks, that looks and sounds amazing, and that works for doing what it's doing, which is something fairly cold, really, yeah, in it, yeah. ultimately. But it depends um, for me. Post-fine. Sometimes I'm quite happy to watch something that's cold as well. Like, for for that reason, I do really like a lot of his films, but... Yeah, well, Dunkirk was fine cold. Yeah. Like, Dunkirk was fine cold, but the thing I is, is when you yet, try and but... do something... When you're then trying to do something like Interstellar, because Interstellar ultimately lives or dies on whether or not you care about the drama and the yeah. people, the people involved, doesn't totally. it? Totally. Yeah, and you don't and, really, and... Um, except for that one scene I mentioned personally. But it's and again, it's it was more the the central concept as well. This idea that like it's such a cool idea that like in theory that like love could be a powerful force more than just emotionally, but something that could impact the physical world. Um, but it just doesn't work. I, I think um, there's 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 several kind of interesting cases throughout cinema where the most the most famous probably being Kubrick giving AI to Spielberg. I did um, want to briefly talk about few... AI as well, but I don't know if we've got time. Yeah. That might be another time. But, we'll but there's a few cases. There's a few cases in cinema of people giving another director the germ of the idea for the movie, like uh, Chap- Charlie Chaplin's uh, Monsieur Verdoux was a concept he got from Orson Welles, for example. Oh, really? There's loads of these situations where somebody somebody kind of have a chat amongst them and the other guy's not working on it or isn't going to make it yeah. and they give it to somebody else. Interstellar would have been a great movie for him to pass to Spielberg. Yes. Like, Spielberg, yes. as manipulative and everything as it would have been, if Spielberg had had that concept... It would have hit, though. He would have... He would have made the emotional bits yeah. like actually work and mean something. I agree. I'd not thought about that before. That's really interesting. I would much rather see Spielberg's as uh, Interstellar. I mean, it would be like cloying as all yeah, shit. Yeah, of course. But but it would probably be an enjoyable movie. It would overall have been much more satisfying, I think. Um, yeah. But yeah, okay. So is there anything else, any other films or franchises or ideas you wanted to talk about in this, this topic? I mean... Yeah, I mean, I think I think we've sort of gone there now. But I, I, I mean, I was going to mention Aronofsky's another name. Oh that yeah, comes of course. Into the mix, we haven't really. No, but we don't have to. We don't have to kind of go down the rabbit hole on that. But I just thought maybe if you had any others just to throw out there in terms of people who consistently make these movies that shoot for the moon and and, and possibly sometimes fall short. Uh, Snyder you know, comes Aronofsky to mind. Does that uh, for sure with things like Watchmen, Sucker Punch to a degree, and then definitely Batman versus Superman. 
Yeah, that's the thing with Snyder is is I uh, I really hate like a lot of people the his his DC comics movies yeah. and I don't really like his aesthetic. To me, to me his aesthetic in Three Hundred and everything else it looks like those Guinness ads from the nineties. <laughs> I you love know, those Guinness uh, ads. Uh, and... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> but the thing is, is to me that's that's the aesthetic yeah. of those movies and I don't really care for it. And the um, uh, but the thing is, it's one of those people, and I guess he's a great example of what we're talking about in that respect, because it's one of those people where I kind of have to hold my hands up and say, I don't like it, I think it's a bag of shit, I don't want to watch any of his movies, but the guy is clearly ha- an auteur with a specific style, yeah. you yeah. know? And the thing about Snyder, like, I, for example, prefer the Joss Whedon Avengers movies to Snyder's DC movies, yeah. but I couldn't tell you a Joss Whedon shot, no, you know, if I. it was lined up against a Favreau or a Doug Lyman yeah, or a, yeah. you know, anyone else. Whereas if you showed me five minutes of a movie I'd never seen and it was a Scott Snyder movie, I'd be like, is this, is this a Scott Snyder? Zack Snyder. Because you would know it. Sorry, yes, yeah, Scott Snyder's the guy that uh, writes the Batman comics. Ah, currently. okay. Yeah, <laughs> Zach, Zach Snyder is the film director. I don't yeah. like. Yeah, so so Zach Snyder. Yeah, but but that's what I mean is that Zach Snyder, um, you you know you know a Snyder. Yeah, it's like a Wes Anderson it, you know. or someone like that. Yeah. You just know. He's, he's got a visual stamp, and you'd be like, that's that's Zach Snyder. Yeah. Like that clearly is a Zach Snyder. Yeah. And I think that with people like that, even when they're not people I personally enjoy, I can appreciate that they're at least of. Uh, have a style and that you know they're not just another you know chris columbus to pick on the poor guy for two weeks in a row oh god yeah 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 no totally and and um i think for me when Zack snyder just goes okay i'm gonna do the style and then i'm gonna just do the action and that's it he normally succeeds but it's when he tries to go i'm gonna do the action and the style and i'm gonna do something political or and i'm gonna do something really emotional or something like this it's when he really he falls flat really falls flat like with... Yeah, I mean, it's it's just a kind of visual stylist, yeah. right? And and the the thing I think that I don't like about it, and that obviously works for Three Hundred with its own roots and its own sort of um, Frank Miller sensibilities, is that his his uh, his aesthetic is deeply fascist. Yeah, like he has a fascist aesthetic. One hundred percent. And and that's where you know. For example, and this again, we can't go down the Batman Superman rabbit hole. Oof. But one of the one of the kind of crucial things for me that marks out Batman versus Superman compared to every other telling of the Batman story, it's killing people left, in, right, and center, in, right? There's that one, but there's also the bit uh, in the opening credits when um, you see ah, the death of his parents. Yes, and... I think we talked about this before, but please go on because I love this interpretation. <clears throat> Well, the fact that in every other telling of the story that I've seen, whether it's the several times it was done in the Burton Schumacher ones or in comic books or in the animated series, Nolan's his ones. parents of Yeah, Nolan's ones, his parents are victims and his father is marked out basically by the qualities of being uh, a decent man or a you know a, a charitable decent man but he's not a warrior no. right whereas in the snyder one you just know that snyder sees that story and goes yeah but what is this guy some kind of a pussy isn't he gonna fight back yeah. because in the opening credits to batman superman um the the dad um uh, what's his name wayne mr wayne wayne senior <laughs> um wayne wayne senior goes into um it's martha and thomas thomas wayne thomas wayne goes into uh punch um, the gun guy, yeah. right? And uh, and that's why they get shot, yeah. right? Even the mum so gets stopped... in on the action, doesn't she? Yeah. The... Well, I think she... I don't think she tries to hit... I think she might try and um, defend her husband or something. Yeah. They're more active. They're not passive, yeah. basically. Yeah. But, which I can see from a filmmaking perspective, you go, like, that's great. You're making these people more active or whatever. Yeah. But... The thing is, is that what it does is it makes it look a bit like it was Thomas Wayne's fault, for one thing. <laughs> and it also marks out right from the beginning that this is a movie about uh, this is a movie made by somebody that that you know has a certain view of how men yeah, behave, they have a very different right? take on this on this uh, <clears throat> yeah. material and of course also it's jeffrey dean morgan as well which i loved it's like even if you don't know what's <laughs> going to happen next you can almost feel it because it's jeffrey dean morgan <laughs> you know and I, yeah, and I think that sort of, anyway, for me, sort of summed up the, the, the attitude of the movie. And I think he does have a kind of um, right wing sensibility that comes through in the yeah. technique. You yeah, know? no, I completely it's a agree. Technique. And, and this is another topic that I might, we want, we want to talk about at some point as well, is the concept of guilty pleasures. Right? And for me, 300 is what I would call a guilty pleasure. I'm not, 
guilty of liking, let's say, Desperately Seeking Susan because people think it's a stupid movie or a crap movie. I don't care what you think, more or less, anyway. I'm a human, of course I care a little bit. But when I feel uh, guilty about a film is when it's completely contrary to how I like to live my life, the things I feel politically, etc. So 300, for me, is 100% a, a guilty pleasure. I've, I've actually still never seen it. It's it's uh, I base all of my critique of 300 on the clips I've seen and the things I've been told. <laughs> it's great fun. Uh, it's really yeah. good fun. Um, horrible, violent, you know, etc. Dark, but great fun. Um, okay, actually, let's talk. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk okay. a little bit about um, Aronofsky just for a bit, because uh, I love Aronofsky. I've been a big fan for years. It was. Um, you know, sort of classic teenage film to watch when you're pushing the boundaries of cinema was Rec Room for a Dream. But it is, I think it still holds up as a really, really good film, if not a little one note in its in its argument. Uh, drugs are bad. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, he's done a lot of films which are risky, which are ambitious, um, some of which have succeeded well, some of which have succeeded less. Um, I haven't seen Mother yet, personally, but I'm dying to see it. Um, what what interests me a lot about Mother, um, just to jump in on that, because I've not seen it yet either, is the fact that um, one of my friends messaged me, he'd seen it at the Berlin Film Festival, and he messaged me to say that it was laughably bad, that it was so bad that it was just objectively everyone in the cinema came out going, that's a complete travesty mess type bad, right? Yeah. Like that's just someone who doesn't know how to make a film yeah. bad, right? And yet then I saw a five-star review from Peter Bradshaw saying that it was amazing. Yeah. And, and I don't know, and, and that's what interests me about Mother and I think Same. which feeds into everything else with Aronofsky is the fact that his films are always divisive. And I've, I, for example, absolutely love Black Swan. Black Swan, if I was listing my, I don't, probably not in my top 10, but my top 50 probably, Black Swan's in there somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's an amazing movie. But I've also spoken to people that think it's a pile of trash and it's just really badly made and whatever. And I think that, that that's something that Aronofsky's movies do that probably feeds in a little bit to why maybe you consider he's made some of these ambitious failures, is the fact that his movies uh, swing for the fences. Totally, yeah, no. And I think actually the fact that neither of us have seen Mother yet, I'm presuming you haven't seen it, have you? No, 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 I haven't seen it. It's a it. perfect sort of encapsulation of this whole idea why we're talking about this. It's because neither of us has seen it yet, but I don't know about you, but I really want to see it because it's oh, yeah. been so divisive it's got that reaction. and it sounds so interesting. Even if I ultimately go away going, oh, that was a five out of ten or even worse, you know, uh, it doesn't matter because it's the the idea that it could just be really different, interesting and something to talk about, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, Noah uh, for me is the big one. For me, all the others, I either like them or really like them. But Noah is the one that's a little bit further down. I still like it, but I can see why others don't. But I remember when me and uh, my partner, Laura, went to see it at the cinema, uh, we came out and we were like, that was amazing. We were like super hyped. And it was really interesting. We were talking about it for hours. And then as the time went on, we were like, yeah, but that was a bit, uh, and that was a bit, uh. anyway, just to wrap up where I showed it to my uh, family at Christmas because I thought, well, ah, this broadly works as something I can show a family. Uh, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so let's see what happens. And they hated it. They absolutely hated it. And they've not uh, let me live that one down yet. And it is rare that that happens. <laughs> yeah, the uh, my experience with Noah is, is um, that I thought it was going to be terrible mm. because even though I loved Black Swan, um, the fact that he was making because I don't I don't really like and I'm not talking about the man as a person but in movies I don't really like Russell Crowe neither do I right I don't I don't care for Russell Crowe at Same. all and he was making a Russell Crowe movie uh, with, about Noah which is not a story I necessarily wanted to watch at the Same. cinema yeah everything um, was stacked and, against it for me you know everything was stacked yeah. against it and Except then the trailers yeah, and then the trailers that came out also look shit yep. because it was like Dirty Ray Winstone grunting at Russell Crowe. I was like, I don't care. I don't <laughs> want to watch this. This looks awful. He's eating a snake. Right? Um... Yeah. And so and so the thing is, is I really didn't have any expectation. Even though I love Black Swan, I didn't have any expectation from that other than this is bad. I went to watch it out of that thing of back then I used to try and watch everything. Yeah, Otherwise yeah. I probably wouldn't have even got Just one quick and, thing. Uh, Sorry, I, I don't mean to stop you mid-flow, but you've just done a brilliant job of explaining why we both... Um, we're on the fence about it, to say the least, um, before it came out and we saw it. There's also another thing that people may not really know about now because it's not really the thing anymore. But there was a period around that time when you would take an old fable or mythology story and you would sort of Lord of the Rings-ify it. 
and that was something that <laughs> yeah. really bugged me about it as well from the trailers um and the eventual film but carry on sorry yeah no no i think i think i think you're right as well it kind of uh, there was a trend at that time for trying to um trying to start to do sword and sandal epics again as yeah. well and, and and it seemed to fit into that but the um yeah I, my experience of it was i went in with those low like rock bottom expectations actually really loved it and yeah. i ended up doing i think i did a podcast at the time about it where uh the person i was doing it with at the time a guy called uh, toby king who's actually given us some suggestions for lists for later on oh, great. But he uh, he hated it it's kind of like what you're saying about your family compared to your view like he he hated it i loved it and and i found that thing um amongst a lot of people i spoke about it with was that it was it was you know and it's damn cliche but it was a marmite film yeah and yeah. that's what makes it interesting and i don't know whether it belongs to ambitious failures in some respects because for one thing i think it made money and for another i don't think it was necessarily absolutely slated but it was certainly my personal experience that a lot of people thought it was a terrible terrible movie yeah so yeah it, it kind of feels like it belongs there yeah, even though by sphere, any any kind of objective measure it isn't one but it kind of feels like it belongs there you know yeah well, he took a while to make his next film after that, didn't he? I mean, I don't know if that was just about that or not, but he's taken he's taken long gaps between. All yeah, and it's yeah, and it's not the first time. That's true. But anyway, yeah. So yeah. Noah, um... because he always he always has a failed superhero project between several of <laughs> his movies, right? Because he was supposed to direct the first. I'm so glad uh... he did not direct Wolverine in the end. Actually, just thinking about it now that we've had Logan from James Mangold, that was such a stri- strike of luck. I think. Yeah, I, I would still really have liked to have seen like because obviously Same, he was supposed to. But then we might not have got Logan. I don't know. Because obviously he was supposed to do Batman and then he was supposed yeah. to do Wolverine and it's like I still really want to see what his aesthetic and his kind of sensibilities would look like translated onto a, a superhero movie. I, I still really kind he'll of get it. I think he will get it. Like. If things carry but on yeah, the way they are, see. but yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, any other films though for you? For I think, I think Logan was a bit overrated. P.S. But anyway, so do I. So uh... do I. I completely, I completely agree with you. I don't think it was yeah. the Second Coming, um, yeah. and I don't think it's Dark Knight. But um, I did really like it. It was entertaining. It was. Ent- it was. It was. That sounds so um, condescending. Yeah, it? Yeah. It, was ent- it was entertaining. It was yeah. entertaining movie. Yeah, so just... uh, but it was. It was it's something to watch. Um, it, was, it was watchable. Was there anything else by Aronofsky that you wanted to talk about in terms of ambitious failures? Like for you personally, because for me, well, none of the others are failures. Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen I Mother yet, fa- though. So, I think whatever your own feelings on it, the Fountain belongs in the same camp as Noah because a lot of people also go, "I hate that." Yeah, like if you showed that to a group of people, you'd also get a lot of them go, "I hate oh, that." Totally, that self indulgent totally. rubbish. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, I think I think the Fountain and Noah are quite close to each other. Yeah, they are in similar the in some ways canon. as well. Yeah. No, I love the fountain. I absolutely love it. Um, but I appreciate that. Yeah, what you're saying is true. That a lot of people would. I, I think. Hate it. I think the thing I have to say with the fountain, and you know, maybe this marks me out as a dunce, but I think it's one of those things where I have to hold my hand up and say I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get. I don't get what it's about. Yeah. I don't get what any of this means, and nothing about it intrigues me to think about it any further and find out. I'm just like, no, because you failed on. Well, that's me, it. Yeah. Failed on the fundamental yeah. level of getting me engaged in the story, getting me engaged in the characters. It's like there are other movies I've seen. For example, 2001. 2001 is a movie I love where even now I'd probably have to say I'm not sure I 100% get it. Yeah, same. But everything about the movie pulls me in to make me want to get it. Whereas The Fountain, I was just like, you know what? I don't get it and I I don't don't care. care, And you're you're boring me. Stop it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I (laughs) I can can completely respect that 100% because it's happened to me before as well where I've watched a film that's trying to tell me something but tell me in a different way or tell me in a complicated way or whatever um and i normally i would go oh okay i'll, I'll check out see what other people thought or what the prevailing theories are etc um back on the imdb uh, boards when they were a thing um but yeah and some of them i just go no i don't want to because you've just really put me off and i just don't care like I, yeah, yeah i completely agree but not with the should we do uh should we do some listener questions? Let's do some listener questions. Yeah. So I feel like I feel like we should have a jingle at this point. Although you know, obviously that's working. But if you if you're a jingle maker out there, yeah. feel free to drop us a jingle. That would be great. Um, <laughs> so basically, if you're uh, tuning in for the first time, as you may well be, uh, we're having a segment at the end of each show where we have 
gotten some maybe questions is the wrong term but basically like missed ideas yeah. from people suggestions so um as an example i'll read one out here from my friend craig monroe who submitted uh one that was early internet era films so the idea is he would say that and then we would have a quick spontaneous chin chin wag and kind of say what comes to mind i thought that was a pretty interesting one actually early internet era films it's a really interesting idea but i don't know if i've seen a single film that would come under that category yeah i mean he he mentions the net and you've got mail uh i can't which which commonly come up when people talk about these films but i've not seen either yeah, I've uh, no. I guess I guess we have to park that one. Where's the, where, what's the one as well where Sandra Bullock gets her whole life destroyed? Is it the net? Because like that might be the net. Yeah, and what's the other one where they're like hackers and it's really funny because it's like oh the one with Angelina Jolie yeah. isn't that just called hackers? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, <laughs> what's the one with hackers? <laughs> what's the one with the hackers? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's that film about the Titanic? <laughs> <laughs> There's a Star War. What's it yeah. called? Yeah. Ah, oh, they were trying to they were trying to save Private Ryan. What's it called? <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think we will have to park it. Sorry, because it's such a good yeah. suggestion. It's a really, really good suggestion. But I've not uh, seen another any of them one. That I think another one he said uh, still Craig Monroe. Another one he said that um, I thought was great, and I think we both will have answers for was strong debuts uh he yeah. listed obviously things like night of the living dead and he mentioned tom ford's a single man which is a good shout i, I really thought. like that film yeah um i mean what would you say mark out as some of the strongest debuts a recent of, uh, one that making? really surprised me uh was whiplash um i can't believe that's someone's first film like in some ways it's a small film but it's it wasn't so... his first film though was it pardon it wasn't his first film, though, was it? I'm pretty sure it was. Uh, I'm just go- I'm just going to his page now. Yeah, yeah. Damien Chazelle, filmography, films. He directed Guy and Madeline on a park bench. Isn't that, that a was short his directorial film or debut. And he directed. Let me have a look. Let me have a look. I thought that was a short it, or something like that. It was 84 minutes long. Oh, okay. So, yeah. unfortunately, unless Guy and Madeline on a park bench knocks out of the park, Damien Chazelle, you've been eliminated from this round. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I saw that before. I remember looking it up, and I just thought that was a short for some reason. Okay. Favorite films you thought were the director's debut? Yeah, yeah. And they were cared about their English. first film. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. Okay. Um. What about? I mean, one for me. If you're thinking about another one, yeah, one on. for me would be Bottle Rocket. Not just because I'm a massive Wes Anderson. No, no, Bottle, Mark, Bottle Rocket is thing... great. It's a great film, but also what's interesting about Bolt Rocket, and I think this is important for this list, and I think you could maybe say similar things about, for example, Blood Simple with the Coen brothers. I think Bottle Rocket, um, Wes Anderson arrives fully formed. Yes. All of his, yes. everything in there, the, the soundtrack choices, um, the Mark Mothersburg music, the uh, using that particular font on everything, uh, the, 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 the themes in the movie, a lot of the cast of actors. Like, Bottle Rocket is already... A Wes Anderson. It's not like you go back and you watch his first film and you go, oh, he hasn't really developed yeah, his style yeah, and his ideas yet. He arrives, he arrives ex nihilo, fully formed, just Wes Anderson is here. And that's that's really interesting to me. And I think it's a really, really strong debut. And it actually is one of my favourite of his films. I'm not, I think on a... No, same. You know, I always think... I always think it's you know difficult to talk about things like this and say objective because we're yeah. talking about something inherently subjective. Yeah, yeah. But I think he's made movies that have like surpassed it in many ways but for me it remains like one of my favorites to watch speaking of films that show a director coming out uh, of the gate fully formed bloody sunday um by paul greengrass have you seen it i've not seen it okay so it's about uh the troubles um yeah yeah and all that stuff um and it is about a specific day and the events that uh, unfurled and it is so greengrass it's unbelievable Um, It's all handheld, shaky cam, digital photography, I think. Um, And it's about a real event and it's very harsh and realistic and tries to be, uh, give you as much verisimilitude as possible. Um, And it's a fantastic film. My favourite of his films, to be honest. I think he's gone a bit bit off the uh, deep end at this point in his career. But uh, yeah, that was a great film. There's kind of, 
there's kind of two different ways you can go with this because you can have the strong debut that's the director arriving fully formed and then you can also have the strong debut that is a director who blows the first one so far out of the park yeah. that they never are able to recapture that lightning yeah. in a bottle and like as much as Orson Welles obviously is uh, a, a celebrated legend who obviously went on to make other good movies like the Magnificent Ambersons and so forth. There's no denying that Citizen Kane stands towering apart at his masterwork, yeah, and that's far. the first one he made. And then you've also got, for example, and I'm not putting this on the Citizen Kane level now that I've said it, but like for example, Donnie Darko, Richard yep, Kelly yep. has always struggled to do Ooh. anything following. <laughs> Poor Donnie man, Darko, right? I always feel sorry um, for Richard Kelly. I can't help it. That was uh, that was one we should have mentioned in the previous topic. Actually, was I've got a friend uh, James Tully who yeah who will go yeah. to bat for Southland Tales day and night. Yeah. Now I haven't seen it, but I think that's another one of those potentially ambitious failure type movies. Yeah, I saw it uh, years uh, ago. Um, I can't really remember it, but yes, The Sixth Sense. There you go. That's another good one. That wasn't his debut. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> it wasn't his debut. What was his first you film? Can't... His first film was an Indian film. Oh, um, okay. It was called... I can find out because I know... I've, I've heard of it before. I'm probably then going to really botch the title. Oh, no. It's called Praying with Anger. That was good for me. I didn't have to upset anybody. Uh, <laughs> Praying with Anger followed by Wide Awake. So it was his third film. Well, there you go. You're very you're very bad at this game. I'm learning a lot today, aren't I? <laughs> wow. Any any others you want to mention? Uh, a Razorhead. I mean, my, my... It's not um, an example of what you're talking about, but it's a brilliant first film. Yeah, I uh, I be- I would believe you on any other day, but now I'm going to have to Google it because you Google just, it, go really, for it. Uh, let the side down. If I screw this one up, it's going to be really embarrassing because <laughs> I'm always going about David Lynch. I know David you're a Lynch. Star, I know you're a big Lynch fan. Yeah. Yeah. No, if it isn't, then you know. If it isn't, I think we should just stop. I'll right just here. quit. Yeah, yeah, I'll just no, quit. Right. Projector, no, close the whole thing you... down, and uh, go about my days. Oh, it wasn't his first film. What was his first film? 1975, My Dinner with Jim. Whatever, make, whatever. Yeah. Uh, nice try. Oh, lol. Um, yeah. So strong debuts. Can you think of any uh, any others that come to mind? I mean, uh, no. I'm. I've got. I mean, there obviously are loads out. There, yeah, there's loads, but yeah, there's nothing that immediately flies flies to my brain other than what we've already said. Yeah. But yeah, a good a good topic and probably one that could have sustained two hours easily of had we easily. had we allowed it to. Yeah. Um, uh, I've got one he here also... from uh, okay, Will yeah. Tate, which is uh, best film about the world ending. Okay. What are you going to go for? Mine, mine is Melancholia. Oh, you bastard. Was that yours yeah. as well? Yeah. Snap. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, we're going to... We're going to do a whole show um, about films that deal with mental illness specifically. Ah, yeah. So I think I think Melancholia is going to come up in a big way. For sure. For sure. But Melancholia... And you and I me have got the... a really interesting relationship with that one as well. Um... Yeah. And I think I think Melancholia for me personally, as someone who's suffered from depression and stuff, which I guess we'll talk about at a later date, but um, is, is the film that most kind of nails that. Yeah. And, it, and it's uh, interesting, and I, I, just briefly, because I remember you telling me that at the time, because I wasn't so hot on it. I liked it, but didn't love it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. And then it, you know why? It's because I hadn't come to terms with my depression yet. And then a couple of years later, it really hit me. I went through all that stuff. And then I rewatched Melancholia and I was like, oh, shit, Rob was right. Like, this is amazing. So, I, there yeah, you, go. you know. Eventually, eventually, everyone realises, Dennis, that I was, I was right all along. So, that's, yeah, but that's that's for me my favourite film about the end of the world. I mean, I wouldn't go as far as to call this a guilty pleasure, but I can imagine it's one people will raise eyebrows at. Yep. But I absolutely love the film Seeking a Friend for the End of the World. I think it's great. Oh, yeah, I remember I love your love for that film. I've never seen it. I... <clears throat> I just had no interest personally. Yeah, it's not one I can imagine anyone then rushing off to see. Yeah, but it's um, uh, it, it's a very sweet film, and it's uh, two actors I don't normally care about at all: Steve Carell and Keira Knightley, who I just I just do not give. I couldn't put half a fuck together. I do like Steve uh, Carell. How much personally. I care about those guys? I do like Steve um, Carell, but yeah, no, Keira Knightley in a bit. And uh, and I I loved it. it really charmed me. Um, and spoiler warning for the movie, although, you know, I don't really think it matters, but it's one of those films like with Melancholia, spoiler warning, where the end of the world actually happens, right? Yeah. It's an end of the world movie. The, the world ends. Yeah. They don't, they don't kind they don't of find the raft and yeah. then kind of like go live happily on the Whatever the, the fuck it's happens a, in you know... 2012. I've not seen it. Yeah. Before. It's, uh, well, yeah, yeah. In 2012, they do end up, they all, they do end up fine, some of them. Oh, um, but yeah. But I love movies like that. Anyway, we could do a whole. We could do yeah, a whole again, one. On yeah, the I really like the road. I, just a quick I'm, shout out as well. Really, really like that film. Um, I love the book, but I hate the movie. Okay, all right. Well, we'll definitely yeah. talk about that again at another point then. Yeah. Because <laughs> okay. yeah, I've not read the book. Um, 
and I'm sure I'm sure the book's better, but yeah. Uh, what else you got? Um, well, I wanted to go through uh, Craig's other ones actually. Uh, films films based on a stage play um, is a good one. He suggested Doubt and Gary Glenn Ross, which are both amazing picks. And I've not seen I mean, either. <laughs> uh, Doubt, Doubt probably would have been my pick actually. Yeah. Um, I I really really love Doubt. It's a very very strong film, and it's one of those things where. Uh, it, it is it is an actor's masterclass like you could the the three the three principal players in that movie because i mean it's i know i think you know people go overboard in their praise of mel streep and i, I think I that sometimes she's kind of verges on self-parody yeah. but Stop i think trying to um, give her more oscars she doesn't need another oscar i mean it's not just but, about need but until she does something truly transcendent to stop nominating it just because she's mel streep please yeah, I think I think sometimes that comes into play when it's like the Iron Lady or something, and yeah. it just seems like, oh wow, okay, they're doing it. Yeah. But anyway, um, I think seeing Philip Seymour Hoffman, Meryl Streep, and Amy Adams, all three of them at the absolute top of their game, um, it's it's really really something special. Doubt, and yeah. it was a movie that when I saw the trailers for it and stuff, I was like, wow, could you make a more boring movie? What is this? Yeah, it's that's like, exactly what, what turned like, me off, and then everyone three... said it was amazing, and I still haven't seen yeah. it, but it's on the list. It's it's very very good. Is yeah. there is there anything you would point out? Yeah. Sort of based on stage play, I, I've already mentioned Carnage earlier in the podcast, which you didn't no, like. No, I didn't. Uh, uh, um, it was all right, but uh, um, no, I recently watched Fences. Um, you know. Oh yeah, Fences is decent. Yeah, I really liked it. I really liked it. It wasn't like the best film ever, but um, it was really good. Yeah, I thought that the performances again. I mean, it's, this is the thing that always comes up when it's uh, stage adaptations, isn't it? Because often it's like one location or limited settings and no frills, and it just focuses on the character and the actors. But no, it was amazingly acted, and I really liked the story. And I I really liked it because it was so unrelentingly grim, yet didn't push you over the edge it like towed that line really well for me i think um mm-hmm. and it, it really got me so yeah i really liked it yeah another another interesting topic thank you very much craig um and then there's uh there's one that i think's an amazing topic but i i can't for the life of me even start to think about answering it but i'll throw it out there because it was a very fun suggestion a dutch friend of mine called uh erwin cortens he uh suggested comfortable interiors like the most comfortable yeah. interiors you've seen in a movie i saw that one i like that that, that came swinging right out of left field and it really i really enjoyed it yeah so i feel i feel like we need to try and address the most comfortable interiors in film i want to live <laughs> in the house that joaquin phoenix has in her i really liked his house i thought that looked really nice it's a nice film. I, mm. I do actually like, uh, maybe it's just because it's on on my mind now, but I do actually like uh, in Bottle Rocket, um, Bob's house with the pool. That, uh, yeah, yeah, that was a nice house. I remember that. <laughs> nice yeah. house. Nice yeah. house. I don't know if it's the most comfortable interior, though. I'm feeling, when I say comfortable interior, I'm kind of imagining like Cushions a little velvet, everywhere. very plush, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure... Um, I'm not sure what the most uncomfortable. I'm sure it'll hit me. I'll probably be like cycling along tomorrow, and then bam, I'll yeah, suddenly think of the most probably. comfortable interior film. Let's have a quick scan, see if anything comes. Yeah. Some reason Hook is coming to mind. It's not really a comfortable interior, but it was like a home or a, a life, a home life environment that I really wanted as a kid when I saw that film. Do you know what I mean? I think yeah. I th- I think um another one that's probably good for for interiors is um. It's all the Studio Ghibli films. You yeah. know when you because I think you spoke before, maybe it was on the podcast or I can't yeah, remember it was, it was the, the but about the food. Yeah. yeah, about food. And I think I think it's strange it's maybe that, that maybe I've kind of connected that with Hook, because obviously Hook's another film that does the uh look at all the food thing. Yeah, you know, I love hungry. that scene. Um and I think but I think the Miyazaki movies do a good job of, of these very warm interiors, you know, these very kind of cozy places that you kind of wanna want to go. Yep. Oh, high fidelity just for his record collection. If I can, <laughs> if I can have that flat, that'd be cool. <laughs> okay, have you got any others? Uh, no, no. I'm just, I was just scanning, and I can't really see anything that jumps to mind. But again, it's, there's, there's it's one... such a cool idea. But <laughs> here's a. Uh... Here's, here's one that's uh, that I think is worth addressing. My friend James Tully, who I mentioned, like Southland Tales, he actually suggested that as his movie that you defend against popular opinion. Yeah. Uh, I think my film I defend against popular opinion, as has already been established, is probably Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. That's that's the film I defend most against uh, public onslaught. What would you say for you is where you end up having to roll up your sleeves and do pitch battle on the most regular basis? Probably something by Lars von Trier. That often comes up. People tend to hate his movies. I really like them. 
Um, well, like Antichrist or something. Exactly. I really like Antichrist. I really yeah, like, I like um, Nymphomaniac. Um, it's not perfect, yeah. but I think he, he managed to do a lot there. Um, I even considered it for the main topic, actually, but I don't think that it's a failure. Um, it it you, falters, uh... but it doesn't fail. So your movie that you defend against popular opinion is basically Lars von Trier. Yeah, basically, yeah, it's a person. <laughs> yeah, yeah or, or David Lynch as well. Like any, a lot of films by David Lynch just really piss people off, or they don't they just really don't like them. But yeah, I can't think of one particular movie right are now. You a, are you a big defender of Inland Empire? No, no. Okay, uh, I'm not. And actually, I, again, I considered that for um, Ambitious Failures because he, I think he tried to do something um, adventurous and different, um, but it really failed for me. I really that was another example where I tried to get people to watch something um, but I hadn't seen it yet it was my birthday and I said come on guys we're all going to go see the new David Lynch film um, when we were in Brighton actually and that really backfired um, and everyone was very angry including myself to a degree (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but yeah no I can't again I can't think of any straight off the top of my head damn maybe we should start preparing for these lists <laughs> yeah i think so i think from next we'll prepare yeah and i think that we'll i'm gonna go in i'm actually gonna find comfortable interiors yeah i, like I, I, I definitely i feel like i defend films that people hate a lot so yeah i'm definitely gonna look at that as well um okay i've got uh, a sil- I tell you what i ended i ended up having my, my friend tom who uh listened to our first episode he may very well be listening now hi tom hey tom uh, my friend my, <laughs> my friend tom was uh, staying with me last week and and i ended up having to defend um in good company which is a film that i like a great deal uh do you know it it's, no it's i've film, never heard of it's it a film with, it's a film with um is it dennis or randy quaid i get them mixed up and topher grace and it's like uh it's it's kind of just a film about topher grace is like the new young boss who like starts to work in an office oh, God, and, that sounds and he rubs up the yeah exactly but it's that it's that kind of thing it's that kind of thing where it's the sort of movie where just from the poster, the name, the oh, cast, and everything, everyone's you... just going to assume it's a pile of trash. Yeah, and actually, but it was it's quite funny. Movie. Yeah, I'll tell yeah. you what, just come to mind, actually, yesterday, this was really weird, right? Um, and I don't want any listener to take this sexist. Please, please don't, right? But on the whole, it seems to be that girls like the film Mean Girls more than men do, right? I don't think that's an unfair thing to say. But yesterday, I actually found myself defending Mean Girls as a film that you should take more seriously um, than you would at first perhaps imagine um, against a couple of girls. They were like, oh, well, you know, it's one of those films that's a bad, good film. You watch it because it's stupid and crap, but um, nothing more. And I was like, no, Mean Girls is actually great. Like, I really like Mean Girls, and I think it's got a bit more going on than people would, uh, well, a lot of people seem to say. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. I think there are lots of films that fit that category. And actually, not to kind of take ourselves down a, a rabbit hole that's probably worth another episode in its own right, but I think in popular culture in general, things that are perceived as aimed at women yeah. tend to get unfairly treated. Yeah. Whether it's music that would be considered like aimed at women or, or films or books or anything, tends to then get tarred with a sort of like, oh, and therefore it's kind of a bit naff brush yeah and i think that that definitely happens with movies uh and i think that for what one of the ways that that you see that a lot is that for example um the the films of the late nora efron for example uh she made several very very highly rated very polished very mechanically good uh you know romantic comedies i'm talking about obviously things like you've got mail but like sleeps in seattle yeah, and, yeah. and you know the kind of the nora efron oeuvre and there's lots of things like that where um, those movies would tend to get dismissed out of hand. Uh, I think, I think, in some part, whether conscious or unconscious, because of the fact that they're considered like women's films. Yeah, well, it's, in, it's in funny you mentioned that bracket. because to go back round on that conversation I had yesterday, um, I may have come off as a bit mansplaining uh, to the girls yesterday when I was saying that it, actually no, Mean Girls is a, a much more serious film. And then later they called my bluff and they were like talking about Dirty Dancing, and I was like, ah, oh, I've never seen Dirty Dancing. And then they were like, well, why not? <laughs> Why haven't you watched Dirty Dancing? I was like, well, you know, what's it got for me? And they were like, don't be stupid. You haven't seen it. You don't know what it's like. It's actually quite good. And I was like, yeah. oh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, obviously I wouldn't judge a film unless I'd seen it. But I was totally judging a film <laughs> that I hadn't yeah, seen. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it was interesting. Maybe that uh, feeds into what you're talking about. Um, yeah. But, okay, I've got a, a silly one here. Uh, best film okay. about cannibalism by uh, Amar Dev Sharma. Thank you, Amar. What films are about cannibalism? I mean, I this is where we go down the rabbit hole of, um, you know, when people ask you what films about, and there are two different ways to interpret it. Yeah. And often what people mean is like what happens, 
And yeah. I always think it's actually what it what the themes and the kind of ideas that are being played with are. To answer that, and for all these suggestions going forward, is both. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Easy peasy. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's the shock films, isn't there? Like the Green Inferno by Eli Roth recently, and then you've got the classic. I use that word <laughs> loosely uh, of like Hannibal, well, like Cannibal Holocaust, Holocaust, and things yeah. like that. Cannibal Ferox, um, but not. All films about kind of, I suppose, all zombie films are kind of cannibal. delicatessen. Delicatessen, good shout, nice. Yes, I really like that film. Really like that film. And also, I haven't seen it, but isn't the cook, uh, the thief, and his lover, or something? Isn't that like about cannibalism, to some degree? Uh, I've not seen that either. No. Do you know it's not a film, but the second series of the League of Gentlemen is all about oh yeah putting, uh, people in pies. That's, yeah, that's yeah, 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 yeah. That I really like that uh, <laughs> that thread in the story. No, yeah. I need to rewatch that. It's so good. Um, I feel like we are missing one though. I suppose a lot of post-apocalyptic films have cannibalism and cannibalism in them. Um, there's probably a really good film where they just happen at some point to have to eat somebody. Yeah. And I just, yeah. it's just kind of like when they're stuck on a boat or something. Yeah. I think, I think what we've discovered is we definitely, instead of ad living these, we definitely need to write a little list each. Yes. For what we're yeah. On. Yeah. So sorry, sorry, yeah. dear listeners. Uh, we'll up yeah. our game for next time. For sure. Yeah, we'll up our game for next time. But yeah, the, uh, I think I'd have to go delicatessen for now. As yeah. A placeholder. I would agree with you. Yeah. I can't, nothing else springs to mind. Um, I mean, do they ever end oh, up wow. eating anyone? I'll tell you what, actually one just has come up on my screen here. Um, Bone Tomahawk. Did you see it? No. Uh, it was a little sort of indie uh, exploitation western that came out last year. Uh, I think, I think, but who knows when it comes to me? That was the director's first film. Um, I've forgotten his name, but I think he used to be, a, he, or used to be, or still is also a musician primarily. Anyway, uh, really good, and it's about uh, people on the frontier, and then some of them run foul of um, local um, Native Americans. And they start getting kidnapped and basically taken off to their their place. But they're not. It's weird. They're like troglodytes. They're not like it's it's framed in a weird way. So it's like they're not the normal Native Americans because there's a Native American character living in the the local town. Um, they're the troglodytes. They're the crazy ones. They're you know they're just brutal primal creatures. Yeah. But it's got a, a really really brutal uh, several scenes of cannibalism towards the end. Um, images that will stay with me forever but the film overall is actually really good i'd recommend it okay i'm not interesting yeah i've not given it a very good um i've not sold it very well but it, it is a lot better than that sounds um yeah no i'm i'll, I'll check it out the yeah. uh let's end on an, another silly one as a friend of mine toby king who i mentioned earlier used to do a podcast with for many years he suggested films that are primarily associated with a hit song uh, and so obviously there's loads and loads you could obviously talk about like the men in blacks and wild wild west yeah, in this world yeah, and yeah. the bodyguard and all these kind of like the one the um the robin hood prince of thieves and all these films that kind of have a really strong sort of oh i'll tell you uh, another one uh that's yeah. not quite as obvious would be do you remember when pineapple express came out and everyone was uh, going crazy for that mia song paper planes yeah. oh yeah, yeah yeah although that was slumdog um popularized paper planes both let's go with both well, but then you can't say this film is primarily associated with this song because, you know, we both had different reactions to that song. True, true. Okay, well. So disqualified. Disqualified. Out of the ring. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Slumdog Millionaire. Oh, that film. The um, the one that uh, came to mind for me that uh, is because my gym... Um, they play the same like ten music videos every day on the on the uh, when I'm there between the hours I'm there it's the same songs every day yeah and one of them that's going round and round and round for the last few months is um, Wheatus Teenage Dirtbag and I don't know if you remember the video for that yes but it's close it's closely tied in to the film Loser yes Nobody that's thought. what it was called I was Nobody thinking Slacker thought. no it's not yeah. Slacker it was like um, Mira Savino and um, not Mira Savino no it's um, I can't remember her name what's either the name of the Oh man, I'm so bad at this now. <laughs> this is this is age, by the way, dear listener. I'm very old, a very, a very old man. Um, what's the name of the guy from American Pie? The uh, the guy that was then in anything else, the Woody Allen film. Um, I really and he, he's like in I Orange Is the New name. Black, and he does also have a really good self-deprecating yeah. turn in um, a very complicated. Jason Biggs. Yes, and he's also in Jason... Jay and Silent Bob. He's really good in that. 
So yeah, so the video for Teenage Dirtbag has Jason Biggs and Mina Savari in it, yeah. who are both obviously from American Pie, but they're in this film Loser, and uh, the whole video is like you know supposed to supposed to help promote this movie. I remember um, I remember an interview with Wheatus when um, uh, after after that film flopped, where they were kind of bitterly saying that you know they did a lot more for that film than that film did for them. <laughs> kind of thing. So uh... I love the idea of Wheatus <laughs> being like, oh, oh my god, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, them getting angry but, uh, and all I can't even think of the phrase I think it was, but yeah. I think it was more sort of like uh, you know they was, that was supposed to help propel their career but actually you know no one gave a shit about that movie no not at all <laughs> but anyway uh, so yeah the, the <laughs> loser and the teenage dirtbag I mean that, that that is a song that has far exceeded the um, the movie <laughs> by far by culture far. reach oh one I really enjoyed <laughs> from uh, childhood was Godzilla terrible movie but i've really liked that oh Quasar. underground yeah, yeah yeah and actually a lot a lot of people don't know this um <laughs> but um you know uh the song all star by smash mouth yes yeah that was uh mystery men oh really it then got used it then got used down the line but i think shrek and a few yeah, other things. shrek was the big but one. um i mean shrek yeah so i guess disqualification shrek popularized it but if you, the the music video for all star by smash mouth is tied into mystery men wow and um mystery men is when i first heard that song because it was all over that movie okay well uh i think that'll be it for for this uh fortnight um but thanks everyone for listening again as always please do send us your suggestions for our last segment or any segment really if you've got a, think you've got a good idea for a, a main theme for the podcast that'd be great too but yeah it's sort of best of um lists and things like that would be greatly appreciated uh thanks for listening uh rob anything you want to say no just if you've got any particular king Karasha memories please share them with us <laughs> please send them uh... a tweet <laughs> please oh, don't 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 harass King Kasha. no i didn't mean like that i just um, meant like yeah. a friendly way just you know but if you want to tell him that you like mystery men because he does retweet people that say they like mystery men oh so there you go there you go i'm tempted you know um i do and i do and i'm i mean this fully seriously i do like mystery men never like, seen I enjoyed it that never movie seen a lot it. when it came out um so you know kinker i'm one of the good guys <laughs> uh kinker if you're listening um <laughs> but anyway yeah yes thank you thank you dennis for another another week's pod and uh look forward to doing this again in a couple of weeks time that's it all right well i'll see you all soon bye bye